Yeah, today my goal is to give you an introduction to generative adversarial networks because it's a very, very popular, but also a very, very big field. And of course, in this one and a half hours, we can't cover everything. But I think today, like really, it would be cool to yeah lay the foundation how these um, generative adversarial networks work. And then um, in the future that you will be equipped with everything you need to know to kind of read the more advanced literature and um, yeah explore this topic more deeply if you are interested in that. So personally, um, I'm, so Jacek mentioned I'm a statistics professor, but uh, assistant professor, but I'm more like a person who likes tinkering. I like coding a lot and that's one of my passions. So in this lecture, I will also have some code examples. Um, I, I'm trying to focus more on the, let's say bigger concepts here, and then also provide you with um, some code examples because that's how I personally like to learn. I usually uh, switch back and forth between like looking at figures and maybe some equations, but then also looking at the code examples and have like a mix of different, um, yeah, different learning resources to help me learn a new topic. So, but um, yes, I use an iPad here with my annotations. So if I look down, it may look weird, but um, it's kind of easier to write on this on my desk and then in the air. So um, just trying to advance to the next slide. Okay, that works. So um, we will be mainly focused today on the original GAN paper, and then we will also implement a convolutional GAN. So it's called a deep convolutional GAN. It's essentially GAN with convolutional layers for image generation. So the first GAN was uh, presented in 2014 in this seminal paper here by Goodfellow and colleagues. And this really uh, laid the, uh, has laid the groundwork for all the following GAN work. So uh, 2014, that's yeah, almost seven years ago and a lot of things have happened um, since then, but still the main fundamental concepts remain the same. So in this paper here, the researchers proposed this GAN. I will talk more about the um, broader concepts later, but just to give you an idea of what they did is they generated new images. So before that, deep learning was really focused more on um, yeah, classification or regression problems. And this was like a new area where they generated images. So there were some related works with um, autoencoders and variational autoencoders. And I believe Alfredo will talk um, more about variational autoencoders tomorrow, which is somewhat related. It's also for um, generating images, but um, the generative adversary networks, they have been really, I would say, groundbreaking in terms of generating realistic looking images. On the right hand side here, I'm showing you some examples from the paper. So they focused only on very, um, I would say very simple data sets because at this point it was more like a proof of concept, just demonstrating that what they came up with actually works. So they, for, its, for instance, here um, generated new um, handwritten digits from the MNIST data set. I'm very sure you've heard of this. It's a data set of handwritten um, digits. And then also here, for example, a face image data set. And you can see this is in grayscale and the resolution is really uh, very low, but um, years uh, have passed after 2014. And um, researchers based on these foundations here have been making progress very quickly. So only a few la uh, years later, people then um, developed these uh, generative adversarial networks with yeah, better capabilities of working with higher res resolution images. So in 2014, we still had these grayscale low resolution images. 2015, um, people worked with color images. 2016, um, the quality of these generated faces became better. And this is 2017, it's also four years ago, but um, even four years ago, people achieved really uh, impressive results where here I'm showing you face images of people that don't exist in the real world. So these are all face images that have been imagined or created by this generative adversarial network. So they are images that don't exist, which makes this um, kind of impressive. So moving on, <laughs> of course, it's not all about face images. That was just one example. People nowadays use GANs for all kinds of things. So there are these fun websites where you can, for example, um, go to this website, this cat does not exist. And every time you refresh the page, it will create a new cat that does not exist in real life. Or yes, yeah, the this person does not exist website, which is yeah, generating these face images. And behind the scenes, when you go to these websites, they are all using uh, GANs, generative adversary networks to gen generate these um, images. Or if you prefer ponies, there's also a website for ponies. And if you ever think about starting a startup and you are lacking maybe 
um, the ideas for coming up with a catchy name or um, logo, there's also a website for this startup that does not exist. Of course, these are more like joke applications, but now in the real world, people use scans also for many medical applications. So it's, it's a, a very, very interesting um, concept. So how we are approaching this lecture today is that today I will start by introducing the main idea behind GANs. So I've just shown you some, some things that a GAN can do, but I haven't explained how that works yet. So I'm planning to yeah, go over the broader concepts, how the GANs work. Then I will um, talk a little bit about the GAN objective, a little bit about the mathematics behind the GAN, but only very briefly. But um, it's kind of like a fundamental thing that you need to know in order to implement again. So we will talk a little bit about that. Um, modify this then to make this uh, easier to implement in common frameworks such as TensorFlow and PyTorch. And then we will implement our first GAN. So we will implement the fully connected GAN, a GAN with fully connected layers, like um, they did in the original paper. And then we will um, generate handwritten digits. And we will be looking at code in PyTorch. I will have a few exercises then for you so that you can also um, toy around a little bit with the code. But yeah, of course, we only have so much time. So it will be a short 10, 15 minute exercise where you um, yeah, do some little um, yeah, looking at the code and playing around with it. And then um, after you've seen the code and um, you have a feeling of how that looks uh, like when we implement it, I will show you some tips and tricks to make GANs work well in practice. So just a few um, yeah, things to consider. And um, then uh, we are looking at uh, DC GAN. So DC GAN stands for deep, uh, deep convolutional GAN. So it's a GAN with convolutional layers. So here um, above, we only look at the simple case and then we modify this GAN to yeah, be better at generating images using convolutional layers. And we will be then working with face images. I will show you the code examples, but yeah, this is uh, something that takes a long time to run several hours. So we will only look at the code examples, but um, if you're interested, I have everything on GitHub and also links that you can then also run this by yourself later and tweak it if you're interested. And then last but not least, I will show you some um, useful resources. If you want to catch up with the latest GAN literature, there are a few um, selected resources that you might find helpful. And I will also outline some of the other GANs that exist. But of course, there are hundreds of different GANs. I cherry picked one of well, some of the most, I would say, fundamental ones. All right, so then to get started, let's talk about the main idea behind GANs. So it's essentially about letting two neural networks compete with each other. So we have two networks and they, yeah, they play this kind of adversarial game where one, um, one wants to uh, generate new images and the other one has the task of telling apart whether an uh, image is generated or not. So the original purpose, like I mentioned earlier, is to generate new data. And classically, uh, originally, this was developed for generating new images, but of course, it can also be applied to other domains. So um, for example, I also, um, like Jacek mentioned, I work on problems related to computational biology. And one example there would be, for example, to create new molecules. So we can also develop GANs for, um, let's say, um, graph uh, structured data to create new molecules. Or you can also think of a more, a more general, just uh, generating new types of data. Why is um, the example of images so popular? I would say it's um, one of the reasons might be because it's easy to look at images. So if you generate an image, you don't have to be an expert in whatever da data the researcher is working with. You can show it to someone and this uh, person would be likely able to tell whether this um, image looks realistic or not. So I think that's one of the reasons why uh, working with images is especially attractive when we are developing new methods, because then it's really easy for everyone to see how good a method is. And how does that work? So it's um, you know, fundamentally essentially about learning the data set distribution, like implicitly learning this distribution of a training set. And then we can sample from this distribution or we can use the distribution to generate new images that have never been seen before. So generating new data. I've recently, for example, also seen applications where people um, also do this um, to augment training sets. So when you have a problem with limited data and you want to train a classifier, um, and you only have yeah, so few examples. Some people I've seen, they uh, use GANs to generate synthetic data. That is also one 
potential application. But yeah, let's uh, focus more on the broad concept here, learning like this training set distribution to generate new data. So here I sketched an outline of a GAN. So, and um, this is a deep convolutional GAN, DC GAN. Nowadays, when uh, people talk about GAN, most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, um, they mean a deep convolutional GAN. So it's essentially a GAN with convolutional layers because if you use uh, or work with images, it's helpful, yeah, as you've learned yesterday in um, Yatsek's lecture, it's useful to work with convolutional layers. So, and this uh, GAN consists of two neural networks, essentially. It's, it's a neural network consisting of two subnetworks. So we have this um, discriminator network here. So this is a convolutional network. And you can think of this as a convolutional network classifier, a binary classifier. And what is, it, was it, uh, what is it classifying? So it's classifying whether an image is real or generated. So if you consider here on the left-hand side, the training set, let's say these are my handwritten digits. So here I have a digit six and a zero, just as an example of two possible images. And these are images from my training set. So these are real images. And the discriminator ideally would predict that they are indeed real. So we have a class label, um, for real images of one. So the class label is one. And the discriminator, we train it to predict that these are indeed real images. On the other hand, then um, a different type of input. I mean, it's also an image, but the second type of input are these generated images. So the generated image is then created by this second neural network, the generator. So the ge generator takes in a noise vector. It's a random vector. For example, 100 elements in a vector uh, sampled from a random uniform or random normal distribution. And this um, then goes through different convolutional layers. So a series of convolutional layers. And you can see here um, based on the shapes. So here on the right hand side, if we go back to the discriminator, I start with this relatively large feature map and then it becomes smaller and smaller or um, the number of channels. So here the width should represent the number of channels and the height and oops, sorry, I jumped too far. The height and width here, these are representing the height and width of the image. So the, the height and width of the image becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and the number of channel becomes larger and larger, or the, yeah, the longer and longer. So this is usually the typical setup for a convolutional network. And you can see for the generator, I kind of inverted this. So you start with a lot of channels, so you reshape this vector into, let's say one by one, by 100 channels vector, and then you go backwards to generate the dimension of the original image. So you end up with a generated image. And then the task of the discriminator is to predict that this is indeed a generated image. So the discriminator is essentially a binary, binary classifier predicting whether an image is real or generated. And the discriminator, the task is to become better at distinguishing between the two and the generator, the the task is to become better at generating these images to fool the discriminator. So there are two kind of adversarial objectives. The generator wants to be better at fooling it, and the discriminator would be well, wants to be better at telling those apart. So in that way, that's why it's called um, generative adversarial network. The adversarial comes from the fact that they are competing against each other. Okay. So how do we train this network now? So I will, in the next slides, outline the uh, main two steps for doing that. So first, step 1.1 would be training the discriminator. So how do we do that? Yeah, like I mentioned before, we then provide it with um, data from the training set. And I should say, um, we don't need labels in our data set, like labels about what type of data that is. It's Kind of like an um, unsupervised method. I mean, the discriminator still uses class labels, but we provide these class labels. We don't have to have class labels for a problem in our data set. So we can generate these class labels uh, by just saying everything in our training set is class label one. These are our real images. And we can say all the generated images have class label zero. So, and we train it um, by yeah, maximizing, for instance, the probability that this is indeed our generated image. So we want to predict class table one. And in a binary classification problem, this is essentially the conditional probability that this is a real image. Given X, X here just means the um, features, the image itself. So we want to train this discriminator to predict 
that these real images are indeed real. Then in the next step, so this is still step one, but I call it 1.2 because uh, now we try to um, train it on the generated images. So there are two things. One, like I mentioned before, we want to predict that the real images are indeed real. And now we want to predict that the fake images or generated images are indeed generated. So here I say fake, but with fake, I mean um, generated. So the same thing. Okay, so here um, also note, I have two annotations here. One is a freeze and one is train. This is one of the tricky parts when we implement a uh, GAN in practice, because uh, when you use, for example, TensorFlow or PyTorch, there is this automatic differentiation. And if things are connected and you call the uh, backward pass or you run the um, gradient computation, it will compute the gradients for the whole network and then do the updates. and this is not what we want. In this step, we don't want to train the generator. We really just want to train, train the discriminator. So we have to make sure that we keep the weights in the generator as uh, fixed or frozen when we uh, update the discriminator at this point. And um, code is, I will show you later how we do that. It's actually pretty straightforward, but it's like a little gotcha. So if you're um, having bugs or are not careful, it's, it's easy to make this mistake that all the weights are updated and then you get weird results and then it's sometimes hard to tell where it's coming from. So that's one thing to keep in mind if things are a little bit funky. Um, it's always good to double check that you are indeed keeping the weights of the generator fixed when you are updating the discriminator. And again, this will become more cl uh, clear later when we look at the code example. So here now, what we are doing is um, we're keeping these weights uh, for the generator fixed and only update the discriminator weights. And again, the goal here is that it outputs uh, a zero class label zero for these generated images. So these um, step 1.1 and step 1.2 were the discriminator training steps. And now step two would be training the generator. Here we do um, the opposite. We are now fixing the discriminator and are only training the generator here. So the generator, now um, the goal is to learn to fool the discriminator. So what we want is now that the discriminator thinks that these generated or fake images are real images. Well, why do we want to do that? Um, yeah, so we, we want to generate, uh, so we want to generate realistic images. And you can think of the discriminator as a critic. You can think of it as maybe uh, a human um, like me or you. And we are looking at this image and we are saying that nah, it doesn't look quite right. And if we say, okay, this is not right, then the generator will get a penalty and it will next time try harder to generate a better image essentially. So uh, we want to make the discriminator better to also push the generator to become better. So yeah, this is like the, the, main, the main outline of how a GAN works. So it's essentially this adversarial game that the discriminator learns to become better at distinguishing real from generated images. And the generator learns to generate better images to fool this discriminator. Okay, so um, this was yeah, the main idea behind GANs. So these two um, subnetworks playing this adversarial game with each other. And in the next um, slides, I will go over some of the mathematics that you may encounter when you uh, read GAN literature. But um, yeah, this is just like the, the brief overview that we kind of need in order to express this training objective in code later on. So I've taken, excuse me. So I've taken this equation from the original paper. So this is the objective, the GAN objective. And um, here at the bottom, this is just a summary of what I've just shown you. If I go back to slides, I added, um, I showed you it uh, like this, and I just summarized it uh, for reference here at the bottom again for you. So it's uh, again, the same setup. The generator here receives a noise vector. It um, becomes the generated images through the generator and the discriminator has to tell apart real versus generated images. And for that, in order to train this setup, yeah, we need an objective, something that we can optimize in PyTorch or TensorFlow. And here, this is um, taken uh, from the original paper. It's expressed as a min-max game. So we want to minimize something while we want to maximize something else. So it's like this kind of trade-off that we have here. So I will, um, in the next couple of slides, also look at a simplified version of that. 
but um, because I think this is like um, one of the most fundamental things about GANs, you will probably encounter this um, in textbooks and in GAN papers. I thought it might be useful to show it to you. But yeah, I can imagine it looks quite daunting. So if you don't know what this E here is, um, this stands for the empirical risk essentially. So it's like one thing in um, yeah, deep learning papers to write something in a more general sense versus the practical one. So here we are assuming we are talking about the whole distribution of the data that the training set comes from. So here the X um, would be like the data distribution. So random variable distributed according to the whatever distribution generated our training set. But of course, in practice, we never really have the whole distribution of the training data, right? So in practice, we only have a training set. So this E in practice would more like become um, a sum over something. So in practice, we would have, let's say one over N sum over, um, let's say I equals one over N. So we would be, a it's more like a discrete version. We would be summing, we would be summing over something instead of having a continuous version of that. But yeah, this, this E symbol here, you can really think of it as um, encapsulating all the data in, that would be or could be sampled from the distribution. Um, yeah, and there, there are two, um, so focusing on this objective, there are two things going on here. We can think of the plus sign here as our, our center point. So this would be something on the left side and on the right side of this plus symbol. So we are combining two things here. And on the left-hand side, we, if we look at this here, we can see um, that there is only the discriminator involved. So we have this dx here and the dx, uh, the d stands for the discriminator and x is just the data, the image data. So let's say this is our image here. D is our discriminator. Oops. Yep. And somehow it's always skipping forward. Sorry. This is our discriminator. And um, what we want to do is we want to maximize this. So this is um, the maximization part. We want to maximize things with respect to the discriminator weights. We want to exp um, maximize the term with respect to the discriminator. And um, I will go through this more slowly, but later, but if we have the discriminator, if it's a classifier and we use, let's say, a sigmoid activation as the last output layer or, or as a last layer in the network, we have scores in the range between zero and one, right? So where that stands for the probability that this is a real image. And um, yeah, what, so if we look at this, so the, um, the log of zero would be, if we take the log here, the log of zero would be minus infinity, right? So this would be very bad. And the log of one would be zero. So in this case, um, we would maximize this whole uh, left hand side if the discriminator indeed outputs uh, a one the score of one that would be the ideal case because otherwise it would be infinitely low minus infinity here so we want to maximize this part so it's just like to a little bit understand what's going on here and then um, we can use that in code to train our GAN so but this is only the left hand part on the right hand part we also have a d here so there's another d and um, we also want to maximize this right-hand side. So this right-hand side here involves um, a G and a Z. So the Z here would be the, um, the noise vector. And um, the G here is our generator. And now we still, I mean, uh, the D, D is our discriminator still. It still outputs something between zero and one, the probability score. And, uh, but now we have this one minus here in front, right? So it's kind of flipping. If we have one minus one, it becomes zero. And if we have one minus um, zero, it, it stays, it's becoming one. So it's kind of like the output instead of zero, one would be now one, one, zero. And then if we have the log, the log of um, one is zero and the log zero, running out of space would be minus infinity. So in this way, it's kind of reversed. So because we want uh, to detect that this is a fake image. So here, the score is maximized um, if we output a zero essentially. So, because we have the one, sorry, we have the one uh, minus in front. So if we output 
uh, zero, it becomes this one, and then this becomes the maximum score. So it's kind of like the opposite of the left-hand side where we also want to maximize, and this is maximized if the discriminator predicts zero. So it's kind of the other way around. And so we were only focusing here on the discriminator part, but then we have also this objective minimizing this for, uh, for the generator. So we could do the same thing now for the generator. And if we look at the left side here, there is no G involved. So we can actually ignore this whole left-hand side, only focusing on the right-hand side. And when is this uh, minimized? This is essentially minimized when the discriminator predicts a one, because uh, the one, we have the one minus one, this becomes zero. And then log of zero becomes minus infinity. And this would be then minimized when, um, when the discriminator outputs uh, a one for this score, because that's like fooling the discriminator outputting or well, forcing it to predict the wrong label. So this is essentially how the scan objective uh, works. And in practice, uh, if you have worked with TensorFlow or PyTorch before, there is something we have uh, available called stochastic gradient descent. It's for minimizing loss functions. I mean, we could just flip it around and maximize something. We call that then gradient ascent. So gradient ascent instead of descent. But uh, why not just simplifying it so that we can use stochastic gradient descent all the way. So here I have um, what I just talked about, just simplified it as a minimization problem. So instead of doing this min-max optimization, we are turning this into just a minimization problem. We can just do that by change, changing the sign. And I will show you in a few slides um, how that looks like. And I can imagine if you first see this, it's kind of like pretty complicated. It's pretty quick maybe also because we only yeah, have so much time here. Um, but I will share the slides with you so you can also walk through this um, step by step later. So if things are not um, clear, and I'm also, of course, happy to answer questions about that. So um, in the next couple of slides, before we go to the code examples, I will do a quick yeah, uh, run through through these equations again. So we have uh, the task of minimizing this granita loss here. Um, I talk about this uh, in terms of what I've done before for the real images, then for the generated images. So I will go back and just show you what's, going, uh, what's lying ahead. And then we will look at the generator loss. And um, I will then explain how we implement that using tools we already have available in TensorFlow and PyTorch, namely the negative log likelihood or also called binary cross entropy loss. And then after that, we will implement or look at the code implementation based on these concepts uh, for generating digits. So going back, walking through this now a bit more slowly. So we are now first focusing on minimizing the discriminator loss. And um, instead of using the GAN objective that I showed you before with this min max, we are only now looking at the discriminator, which is which we turned into a minimization problem here, just by adding this minus sign here in front. But um, yeah, the, the concept remains the same. So we are assuming that for the real images, we have the class label one, and for the generated images, we have the class label zero. So we want this discriminator to output a one here, and we want this discriminator to output a zero here, ideally. That means that it correctly predicts real images as real and generated images as generated. Okay, so like I mentioned before, the value range that we can get from the discriminator is some value between zero and one. This is usually because we use a logistic sigmoid function like in a regular classifier. So the logistic sigmoid function would be something, uh, don't make a mistake, it should look like this where here, um, Z would be the logits um, when you have uh, compute the um, inputs to a layer, like the, the, weighted, the weighted sum. So if we have some weights, I, and some inputs, usually the inputs, we can denote them as A because they are, they are the activations from the previous layer, plus some bias unit. If we call that Z, then if we put the Z through this um, logistic sigmoid, the output range would be between zero and one where one here would uh, correspond to a high probability that this is a real image, and a zero would correspond to a low probability that this is a real image. Um, 
I, I don't have a slide on this, unfortunately, but if I would just um, briefly sketch how the sigmoid looks like. So if we would plot this logistic sigmoid values here, oops. This would be like an S shape, like an S shaped curve and um, between the value one and zero. And it's not a great drawing here, but there should be the center point here where it um, cuts the line at 0.5. So usually we say, we usually in practice use a threshold function and say, if this value is above 0.5, output class table one. If it's below 0.5, output class table zero. That's how we convert these um, values into class labels. But here for the gradient computation, we don't do that. It's more like for the final step when we um, compute, let's say, um, you know, classification example, or when we want to return the class tables. Here we are just working with these scores directly. But the same concept applies. We want the score to be close to one as possible. So if we have now for the real images, the possible output range between zero and one, we add the lock in front. This turns into then a minus infinity to zero range because yeah, the lock of zero is minus infinity and the lock of one is zero. And then now when we add this minus in front, this will then turn into infinity to zero. And we want to minimize here, right? So this is a minimization problem. We want to minimize this. You can think of this as a loss function that we want to minimize. And if we trace this back, so zero, zero, one. So ideally the, the highest value we can get here is a zero, right? So the highest value we can get for this expression is a zero. And this is uh, achieved if we have the output label one here or an output close to one. So yeah, so we want the discriminator to predict a one here. And the same, can do the same thing for the generated images. So for the generated images, we get the value range between zero and one. And now we want to predict the class label zero because they're not real images, they're now the generated images. So that's why we have the one minus here in front. So the one minus turns the zero one range into a one zero range. And then when we add this minus here in front and the lock, this turns into a zero infinity. So here in this case, this whole expression here or the expression on the right-hand side of the plus symbol. And of course, considering the zero here, uh, the, minus, the minus sign, then this has a value range between zero and infinity. And it's minimized when we have again this zero and it's um, zero when we have the output zero. If we have an output of one, which would be very bad, very wrong, then we have an infinitely large loss, which is very bad. So this is like the setup for minimizing the discriminator. Now for the generator, we want it to fool the discriminator. So we want it to become better and um, so that it becomes so good that the discriminator can't tell apart what's real and what's fake then we have kind of achieved our goal. But of course, keeping in mind that this, the, the discriminator also becomes better all the time. So it's kind of like this adversarial game, but here, yeah, we are um, training the generator to become better at fooling the discriminator. So we want, in order to fool it, or when it's fooled, we want the discriminator to predict a one now. So it's generated, the true label is zero, but we want it to predict the one because we want to fool it. All right, so how do we do that? I mean, we use um, similar setup here. It's again, a minimization problem because it's easier to implement in um, PyTorch because we can then use just stochastic gradient descent or let's say the atom optimizer. And um, yeah, so what we do is again, or we look at this. So the D here is again, still the discriminator. It outputs values between zero and one. Um, the lock turns this into a minus infinity to one range, a uh, zero range, sorry. And, but now we are not using this one minus here. We are basically just dropping the one minus that I had earlier here. So in this case, the range, if we add this minus becomes infinity to zero. So the minus infinity turns to infinity, the zero stays zero. So here in this case, this is minimized. The loss function is minimized. If we have a zero, this is when we predict the one. So if we go through here, so it would be minimized if it outputs a one. And yeah, this is essentially um, how we turn the scan objective just into a minimization problem. And um, if you are familiar with logistic regression, there is something called the negative log likelihood. 
and we also call it the negative block likelihood loss. And um, another work for that is the binary cross entropy. It's really like uh, the negative log likelihood, likelihood is more motivated from a statistics background, whereas the cross entropy is uh, something motivated from information theory. But they are referring to the same thing. It's just like um, different fields came up with similar concepts um, independently and then gave it different names. So um, in PyTorch, um, there's a cross entropy function that is referring to the multiple or the multi-category cross entropy if you have more than two class labels. But if you have um, only two class labels like in the original logistic regression, then you can also use the so-called binary cross entropy. So binary stands for the two class labels zero and one. And here this plot in the center is showing the loss function. So the uh, binary cross entropy loss function of four different input values. Here this y hat, uh, y hat i, i stands for the, let's say i's training example. And the y axis shows you what the loss is corresponding to this training examples if you predict a certain value. Like we said before, the values are in the zero one range that we can have. And if the label, the true label y, um, yi, so this is the true class label. If this is one, then we look at this blue loss curve here where the arrow points to. So then we, we look at this one. And if it's a one and we predict one, then the loss is zero. This is what I've shown you in the previous slide. So the, the loss will be zero, as low as, as it can get. And then the more wrong we are, the exponentially higher this loss becomes. It would approach infinity here, but um, it would be for a very small value. I mean, if we approach zero. So here, I, when I plotted this, I think I used 0 0.01 or something. So it wouldn't crash because I think um, NumPy gives you an error if you put in a log of zero. Um, and anyway, so the loss becomes higher, the more wrong we are. And the same is true here on the right-hand side. So here on the right-hand side, assuming that the true class label is zero, we get a zero loss if we predict a zero. But the more wrong we are, the more, the farther we are away from the zero, the higher the loss becomes. And we, yeah, we can express this in the following equation. So this loss function I'm showing you in the plot can express this in the equation here at the bottom. And this is the binary cross entropy loss. So and it's this um, empirical, uh, empirical one because we also don't look at the expectation. We really you look at the discrete case where we have a fixed size training set with n training examples. Or well, it could be your batch size. If you compute the loss only on a mini batch, then this would be the n would be your batch size. And um, yeah, we can also turn this equation into two sub equations. So the plus sign here again divides the two halves. And if we now plug in the true class table, let's say we first start with class table one, then this one here becomes one. This one becomes also one, but you can already see one minus one becomes zero, right? So then this whole thing here becomes zero and zero times something is zero. So, so this cancels if the class table is one. If the class table is one, we are only looking on the at the left-hand side. Vice versa, if the class label, use a different color, if the class label is zero, then we have one minus zero, it stays one. On this side though, the yi is zero because it's what we're assuming, we are given a class label zero, then we have zero times something, so this cancels. And then we are only focusing on the right-hand side, which is then this one becomes just one, becomes in log one minus y hat. And this is the binary cross entropy that is implemented in PyTorch and TensorFlow and so forth. And now if I go back a few slides, this is exactly the setup that we have here, the log one minus something, and here this log of the discriminator. So you can see what we have in the GAN objective is, can be easily implemented using this binary cross entropy loss. So we don't have to write a new loss function. We can just reuse what's already there in PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, yeah, so then now go, coming back to the GAN context. So when we want to implement this now, again, same as before, we use the class labels one for the real images. So we have a bunch of real images in a training set and we just create a vector consisting of ones. 
And we want the discriminator then to predict for these um, also ones. And for the generated images, we create a vector of zeros and we want the discriminator to predict these zeros using this binary cross entropy loss. All right, so, and for the generator, there's a little trick. So what we do is we just, in order to fool it, we flip the class labels. So we have, I mean, we have created these before, right? So here we have created the vector of zeros for the generated images. Now we just flip them. So we flip these class labels to class label one and then train the discriminator on that. So it learns kind of, it learns to predict the wrong thing for training the generator. Okay, so this is exactly like before. This is just how we would then um, implement it in code. So I have prepared a code example, like just implementing these concepts that we have talked about. But of course, <laughs> PyTorch, um, also TensorFlow, they are involving a lot of code. So it can be hard to find, let's say the needle of the haystack, the parts we're looking at. So I will walk uh, with you together through the code example. And then I have a few exercises for you. So I will just um, show it to you very briefly, but they will be in the code. So you have then like 15 minutes to um, think about the solution here. And uh, so there's exercise one, two, and three, they are just comments. And your task would be uh, essentially to, um, instead of writing code from scratch, to uncomment the correct one, whether it's A or B. And I thought it might be simpler because if you have not used PyTorch extensively before, I think writing PyTorch code can be a little bit daunting. So I try to give you a little, help in a little template here. Okay, so the code example can be found, uh, I uploaded it both to Collab, uh, Google Collab and uh, DeepNode, which is uh, the same thing as Google Collab, but just in case one of the two doesn't work, you have the other one. And I should probably post these links also in the Slack channel and here in Zoom so that you can um, just click on it and it should open. So maybe let me just do this right now. Um, I think. One second, okay. We'll just copy these links. So let me share them in Zoom because I I'm assuming everyone has it open. Um, well, I'm actually not sure how to um, open the chat window because I don't want to accidentally close this here. Let me share this in Slack. And the second one. So yeah, your exercise would be now to um, look at the code and then try to answer the questions or uncomment the right code. But I can walk you through the code example, let's say 10 minutes, and then you have 15 minutes to do the code example. So let me also open this notebook now. I have to change my screen sharing to my web browser now. I think this should be it. Can you see this um, at all? We can see the notebook. Perfect, okay. So this is a very long notebook because there's a lot of boilerplate code required um, for loading the data set. So if I just scroll through this, you can see there are a lot of things to it. So um, lots of code. This is just for observing the training, and then in the end, um, evaluating the results. So starting at the top, um, okay. starting at the top, so here this would be importing just some um, libraries we, will, we are using. Oh, okay, I have to confirm. So just importing some libraries we are using, like Torch Vision, Torch. Um, here, this is just a shortcut, matplotlib for plotting and NumPy for some other things. And these are Python standard library um, things. Okay, and here uh, are just some general settings. So you can run this code either on the CPU or the GPU. So if you are go using Google Collab, you can go to runtime, change runtime type, and then select CPU. Or actually, you can't select CPU anymore, interesting. GPU or TPU. Now, I think none means CPU, okay. So GPU will be a little bit faster, of course. 
Um, yeah, so then some hyperparameters, of course, the random seed, it's maybe something you shouldn't tune as hyperparameter, but um, the learning rates of the discriminator and the uh, generator are, for example, hyperparameters, something you have to tune to find a good one so that the network learns well. It's the same concept as with a regular convolutional network. The number of epochs and the batch size, and then also the image dimensions. It's just some general settings here. Um, we are working with the MNIST data set, so they are 28 times 28 dimensional, and there's only one color channel because they are grayscale images. Here, these are some functions I personally like to use. Um, okay, I should probably execute them before I can execute that. So these are just some, uh, some function I personally like to use because they make the code deterministic. That means if someone else runs the code, they will get exactly the same results. Because by default, if you use the GPU, um, NVIDIA, the CUDA library, um, determines based on your hardware, based on the computer, which um, convolutional uh, layer function it uses. So there are in the library multiple ways to compute a convolution and they should give you identical results, but there are some rounding errors, some approximations. So on different computers, you can get different results. And if you run a network over the course of training, you can get vastly different results. And so I personally like to fix this so I can reproduce results, but um, it really depends on which context. It's mostly if um, for research, I, for example, if someone asks me to confirm that the code is correct, I can reproduce the same results. That's why I'm using it, but um, it's not super important in this context here. Then we are um, loading the data set here. So this is the MNIST data set we are working with. And MNIST is already implemented in PyTorch, and uh, sorry, in Torch Vision, which is a Torch library or PyTorch library for computer vision. And we are loading, importing this data sets here. And um, we are just using it from there. And this is a, here a normalization. So what we do is we, uh, so what happens is it will load the images as PIL, Python image library images, and the two tensor method converts this into PyTorch tensors automatically. And in this function here, what PyTorch does automatically is convert everything into the zero one range. So pixel images are usually in the range between zero and 255, but this two tensor will convert it to zero and one. It can be a little bit better for performance optimization reasons, like the stochastic gradient descent performs better when um, things are centered at zero. So we can achieve that by standardizing or normalizing these images. So here, the first value stands for the mean and the second for the standard deviation. So if I have something in the zero one range, let's say I have a pixel value of zero, standardization would subtract the mean. So it would be one minus 0 0.5. Can maybe write this down? One minus 0 0.5, which will become so if pixel value is one, sorry, then it's uh, one minus 0 0.5. This will become 0.5, right? And then it's dividing by the standard deviation. So it will divide 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 and the output range would then be one. Now, if I have a pixel value of, of um, zero, then we have zero minus 0 0.5, which is then minus 0 0.5, whoops and then minus 0.5 divided by 0.5 is minus one. So what this will do, this normalization will normalize the pixels such that uh, they are in minus one to one range. This is kind of a, a little, maybe I'm going into too much detail, but this is like a little um, aspect you need to consider when implementing it again. You have to know the pixel range because the generator is supposed to generate images. And if you want to, um, yeah, when you want the discriminator to make a good prediction, the training set images and the generated images should be on the same scale, right? So this is like a minor but important detail. Um, yeah, so we are passing this custom transformation function. One also one thing to say is we are only using the training set. We are not using the test set or validation set because it's an, an unsupervised approach here. We are generating data. We don't want to classify anything in the training set. Um, I think this might take a few minutes to run nowadays, I, you know, it's made faster. It depends, I think, on how busy the server is. A lot of people are downloading the MNIST data set. So sometimes the server from, I think, yeah, Jan Le Kuhn, his website uh, might be a little bit slow sometimes if a lot of people download things. So Jan Le Kuhn was uh, the person involved in uh, collecting the original MNIST data set. I think it was in the 1980s. 
Um, yeah, and here, this is just checking the data set. Um, I like to do that just to make sure everything looks like as it should be. So we chose initially a batch size of 128. And we can see when I print this size here, the batch size is 128. There's one color channel, 28 pixels uh, image height, and 28 pixels image width. And there are the corresponding class tables, but we are not using class tables. I just printed them here, but we don't use class tables for GANs. Okay, here I'm just showing you a random selection of 64 images from the first batch. So from this first batch here, I loaded. So just to take a look at how they look like. And here's our main GAN now. So this is our GAN. There will be an exercise for you whether we use sigmoid or 10H here for the generator. And um, so how this is organized is I organized it into two sub networks. This is using torch and N module to make a neural network. And then we have a generator here and a discriminator. So there are several layers, a, a fully connected layer. It's called linear in PyTorch. A liquid relu, this is like a relu function, but with a small slope in the negative range. I'm using also dropout. And that's about it. And I'm doing the same thing here for the discriminator. Um, there is a, a flatten here because the discriminator receives uh, an image of MNIST, but a fully connected layer assumes that it's a vector. So I'm just reshaping the 20, or the one times 28 times 28 image into a 784 dimensional vector essentially. So, and for the generator, so I, here and here, I define these networks. So here I'm just saying what layers we want and what the parameters are. And here in the forward method, these are the instructions or functions to execute that code. So these are, essentially executing it. So here, how we execute it is we flatten the input. So we have Z. Z, I made a note here to myself. It has the dimension NCHW. So N stands for um, batch size. Um, C is for color channels. Um, H is for the height. And W is for the width. So it's just like this, um, it's a matrix, a tensor, a four dimensional tensor of N times C times H times W. And this is because I implemented this GAN, DC GAN for the face images, which I will show you later. And I have the same training function. I just wanted to reuse as much code as possible. This is why um, the training function will feed this one an image, not a, a, a vector. But yeah, we will see that later why why that is. So don't worry about these details at this point. And what happens is then the generator receives this noise vector Z, outputs this image, and then the image, because this is the fully connected layer, is a vector, and we are just reshaping it again to get back an image in this NCHW format. So color channels, height, and width, and then Z zero, size zero is the batch size. Now here is the discriminator forward method. So the discriminator forward method is um, just running the discriminator and it outputs the logits. So the logits are here um, the outputs. So it should be a sigmoid function because, like we said, it outputs the zero and one, or the range. The output range could, should be between zero and one. I removed that. I uncommented this because. That's how the loss function PyTorch works. So there's a loss function cross entropy and uh, a loss function called binary cross entropy with logits. So this one expect, or both of them expect logits instead of the sigmoid. And this is just for um, stability reasons. It's to um, stabilize when you compute the gradients like for numerical stability. There is also a function. So there's um, a function and LL I think it's called NNL loss or something like that. NNL could be like this in smaller uh, case letters. It stands for negative log likelihood loss. It's the same as the binary cross entropy, but this one would expect the probabilities, the sigmoid. So it's just like a minor, minor uh, implementation detail. So the binary cross entropy conceptually works with these probabilities, but the way it's implemented in PyTorch is you provide it with the logits for numerical stability and internally. So the function, the loss function itself will do the sigmoid for you. So if we would call sigmoid here, 
it would basically call sigmoid twice, which is what we don't want or don't need. Because then the gradients would be a little bit small. Because the gradient, I think, uh, in sigmoid, if it should be the largest gradient we can get, I think, is 0.25. Uh, so if we have 0.25 times 0.25, it would be unnecessarily making the gradient small. All right, so this is our model. And now we define some optimizers. And this is a tricky part I mentioned before, where we have to be careful that we want to freeze the networks when we uh, train the other network. So if we train the generator, we want to freeze the discriminator. And if we train the discriminator on the um, generated images, we want to freeze the generator. In practice, this is uh, very simple in PyTorch. We just use two distinct optimizers. So we will uh, use one optimizer for um, the generator. And we only give it the generator parameters here. And then we have an optimizer for the discriminator and we only give it the discriminator parameters. So this one is only updating the discriminator and this one is only updating the generator. And then here I have my training function. It has a lot of um, things going on, but many of those are just for logging so that we can visualize the loss later and look at the results. So um, here we are using, um, the binary cross entropy with logits loss function. And this one expects the logits. There's also a binary cross entropy, which um, would then work with, with the sigmoid here. But uh, for numerical stability, it's recommended to use this one. Here we have our fixed noise. It's a 64 dimensional vector that is then reshaped into 64. Oh, sorry, 64 is the batch size. 64 dimensional, oh, sorry, 64 vectors of the dimension latent dim. And I think I set this to, if I go to the very top, I didn't set it somewhere here. This should be, maybe I set it later when I call the function. Uh, scroll down. So I'm defining the function and then I'm actually calling, oh yeah, here I'm calling the function. So yeah, I will set this to 100, but it's again a hyperparameter. It's something to experiment with to see what works well. Usually, the more complex the images, um, the more layers you need. And also, sometimes you want a, a larger latent dimension to start from. But usually, 100 is a good number. So we are also later you know, going to use 100 for the face images. Um, OK, so going back to where I stopped. OK, so now this is our fixed noise. And I'm using this fixed noise to evaluate the results during training because um, in this loss in this training function I have a sub function that looks at the generated images for every 10 epochs and then using this fixed noise we start from the same noise and it's easier to compare how much progress the GAN makes but then during training we actually use um, new noise so here's a new noise should say uh, rent n is a random normal distribution so I think the n yeah the, should stand for normal distribution you could also consider a uniform distribution so that would be another exercise. So here, this is the training loop where we are iterating through the training data set. And then we are initializing or putting the real images onto the GPU. If you train this on a CPU, then this is a kind of redundant, the two device. So the two device would just put it on the device that we chose either the CPU or the GPU. Um, and yeah, then we have the noise. We have the fake images, which come from the generator here. And in this step, we are first, uh, what are we training? We're training the discriminator first, okay. So we get the fake images. We get the flip, the flip fake images. And then we are training the discriminator first. So we call the forward method that we defined on the real images, compute the loss with our binary cross entropy loss. And then we do the same thing with the um, generated images. Here I'm using fake images detach. And this is so that we don't use the gradient because otherwise it would uh, also update the generator or not update it, but compute the, the gradients, right? So we, we don't need that or we don't want that because then the computation graph becomes unnecessarily complex. So we are only using um, the fake images as is. So this will really this step temporarily will decouple the face uh, fake images from, from the generator. So it's like a decoupling step, just that they are like the regular images. Um, yeah, and then here I just um, combined, I mean, you can 
you probably have seen that before, backward will uh, run the computation graph backward to compute the gradients. We can do this uh, in two steps separately for the real loss, the loss on real images and the loss on fake images. Or we can just put them together because um, the sum rule in calculus would compute them separately anyway. And then we only have to call backward once. And then we update the discriminator. Next, we will update the generator. So we have a very similar approach. We call the discriminator forward to predict the images here. Then we call the generator loss, uh, compute the generator loss on the fake images and the flipped fake images, call backward and update. So there's a lot of stuff going on and we only have yeah, not that much time. So in that way, it might be a little bit overwhelming, but I hope the exercises are pretty uh, straightforward. So I will give you 15 minutes for these little three exercises in this process you can also maybe look a little bit at the code and or let's say until let's say 12 minutes so then uh, in my time at 12 30 i can in the last 15 minutes talk a little bit about um the face images and also the gan resources so the remaining code before i uh, let you work on it the, the remaining code here is uh, only like for logging purposes it's computing or saving certain things and computing the loss so that we can plot this here. So I'm just, this is only for visualization so that I can see during training what's going on here because sometimes these numbers become very large or very, very small or they become NAN. So there's some error then and it just helps me to during training to see what's going on because it may take a while. You probably don't need 100 epochs by the way. It's a little bit excessive. Um, Okay, if I go down, and this is then a plotting function. So this is how the losses would look like if you uh, solve the exercises correctly. And then here are the generated images. So it starts really, really very random. So this uh, is at epoch zero, so very random um, outputs. And you can see at epoch five, it already improved a little bit. Then at epoch 10, it looks um, a little bit better, even better, and after, say after the last epoch, they kind of, I mean, not all of them, but some of them look like uh, real handwritten digits. So here kind of like a seven, this is like a nine, a zero, an eight. Of course, there's a lot of outputs that don't uh, look well. If you look at the original GAN paper, um, the results actually look better there, but um, the original author also mentioned in a talk once that they cherry picked the results. So that means not all of the results are good. They really picked the good ones. And this is like picking, let's say this eight and nine and seven to show the results. But of course we could get way better results with more sophisticated GAN methods. But again, this is like the simple GAN with the fully connected layers just to, for introduction to become familiar with the loss function. All right, then I would say, I will give you uh, 12 minutes to work on this. And then I will be back and talk more about um, the DC again.
Okay, so um, I saw there are a lot of questions in the chat. I answered some of the questions regarding to overfitting. There was another question about why only real images are used for training the discriminator. So why not, um, when, I read, when I read the question correctly, it's about asking why not mixing the real and the fake images. And I will get to that in a moment. So um, that is a very good point. Um, it has something to do with batch normalization. I will talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so in the remaining, I think 15 minutes, let me just tell you the solutions, of course, and then um, talk a little bit about some tips and tricks, the face images part, which will be very quick, and then maybe some further resources for you to learn more about the recent developments in the GAN field. Okay, so um, scrolling up here, exercise one. So here the solution um, should be 10H. And this is um, because, um, this is why I spent so much time on explaining the data loading. This is because we have this line of code in here, which normalizes the images such that, that the pixels are between minus one and one. And with a 10H function, we match this output range. If I remove this part, then we could use the sigmoid function in the uh, generator. But with this line of code here, the highlighted one, we want to use the 10H function. And um, yeah, the other exercises were, I would say, rather um, simple. You could maybe read them up from the slides even. So um, for real images, we use, oops, I did a jump. For the real images, we would use the ones here. So we would, oops, why is it fake? Okay, I, it jumped here for some reason. The real images, we would use the ones. And for the fake images, we would use the zeros. And then for the flipped ones, the flipped fake images would also be the ones then. Um, by the way, I uploaded the slides to GitHub. I shared a co uh, the link in Slack if you want to have access to this um, later on. And there's also a version, if I go here, there should also be a version in here that has the solution here, this one. Okay, so moving on with the lecture then. So. Oh, I skipped a little bit forward here. So we stopped at this point where we were playing a little bit with the GAN. And here I just wanted to share a few tips and tricks with you to make GANs work in practice. So there is this nice GitHub repository by Sumit Chintala, who was involved in um, developing the first deep convolutional GAN and also later the Wasserstein GAN. Um, so he compiled a list of different tips and tricks. I think there are 17 or 18 tips and tricks. Um, he says that they are maybe not super relevant in 2020 anymore, or he is not sure how relevant they are. I think most of them are super relevant when it comes to the regular GAN training, but then there are some advanced GAN methods that use different tricks. So these tricks different, definitely apply still to all the, I would say regular GANs. For some of the later GANs, there are additional tricks and tips that are not in this list. Um, but you can find them in the research papers. So um, just going through some of those, uh, not all of those because we don't have so much time, but there's also the link if you want to read through this. So one tip would be normalizing the inputs. So normalize the images between minus one and one, and then use 10H as the last layer of the generator output. And yeah, this is uh, what we did. So we did that in the code. So we used 10H in the generator. This was one of the exercises. And here we had this normalization between minus one and one. Another trick would be uh, the loss function. So I glanced over this detail. So um, in the original paper, they propose the GAN objective and then they flip around the labels because um, otherwise the gradients would be too shallow. We really didn't discuss that in too much detail because of um, time constraints, but uh, just a short version here would be we are adhering to this tip as well. So instead of having max log D, we have, you can turn this into a minus min log D, it's the same thing. And we also flip the labels when training the uh, generator and discriminator. So this is also something we have done in code. So this is um, also implemented um, in our code examples. So we use yeah, min minus log D basically. We do not see the presentation anymore. Oh, sorry. I think that's because I'm still sharing the browser. Thanks for noticing that. I will. GitHub. Okay. 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 Um, let me share the keynote. Okay. I think 
No, it should work, right? Yes, it's okay. Ah, oh, sorry about that. I shared the wrong screen. Okay. Um, yeah, here's the link to what I mentioned before, the tips and tricks uh, for training GANs. And um, yeah, what I just talked about is uh, tip one, normalizing the inputs between minus one and one range. So this is something we did in code. So, and then the other tip I mentioned was uh, flipping the labels, which is also what we've done in code. So I glanced over the detail with the gradient, but I have on YouTube, I can also share you um, with that, that with you later, a video on explaining the gradient issue. It's like a 20 minute video or something. So I unfortunately don't have time to go over this detail, but just wanted to mention um, there's a reason why we flip these labels. Um, Using another tip would be using a spherical Z instead of a uniform distribution. So it's also in practice better to use a Gaussian or random normal distribution like we did instead of the uniform distribution. And also this is a tip that we adhered in our code example. So with this rent N. So sampling the noise from a normal distribution instead of a uniform one. Um, and this goes back to the question that someone asked um, in the chat. So why don't we mix um, real and generated images in the batch? Why do we use them separately? This has something to do with uh, when we use batch norm, it performs better if we keep them separate as real images and generated images instead of mixing them. In our code example, we didn't use batch norm. Um, yeah, we didn't use batch norm, um, but I used batch norm in the DC again. So we can take a brief look at that one. Um, yeah, so there are more tips, but yeah, due to time reasons, I was thinking we would probably not have enough time for that. And I think this is about true. We have like 12 minutes left. Oh, no, actually eight minutes, sorry. So um, I yeah, encourage you to go to this list here and maybe on your own time, walk through this list and see whether we implemented these things in code. And you can also uh, yeah try to remove these tips and tricks in a way like maybe not normalizing between minus one and one and see what happens, whether it makes the results better or worse. It might be an interesting exercise. Um, yeah, okay. So then the DC again for generating the face images in PyTorch. So the real only novelty here is that we are now replacing the fully connected layers with these convolutional layers. And um, yeah, it's a convolutional network. Uh, they say notably no fully connected or pooling layers, just convolutional layers. And um, yeah, I implemented this in code. So this goes back to a um, paper in 2015. It's pretty old. I mean, this particular architecture is pretty old, but nowadays, if you look at all the new agents, they are all using convolutional layers if they are generating images. Okay, so I have the code example not on Google Colab, um, but you could upload it to Google Colab if you wanted to. The problem with that is um, it's a large data set. It's the Celeb A data set is 1.7 gigabytes. So it's something I thought we don't have time to run in this lecture, but I have the results in the notebook and on your own time, if you're interested, you can run the notebook. Um, there is a function in Torch Vision to download the Celeb A data set, similarly to the MNIST data set that we have seen before. But unfortunately, every time I try that, it runs out of, or it complains because I think they have a quota for downloading, I think it's hosted on Google Drive and then too many people download it, they exceed, exceed the quota. So you can find the original Celeb A data set on the original website here, where they have different download links, I think to Dropbox, Baidu and uh, Google Drive. And I also prepared a file which has exactly the files that you need, um, the zip file here, and I uh, uploaded to my Google Drive. So you can technically just download this Celeb A.zip from this link and put it into the same directory as your notebook is, and then it should work. Okay, let me um, briefly go to the notebook, share the different screen now, and then I will show you briefly the deep convolutional GAN. All right, so it will be, so this is um, in the GitHub repository if you want to download it and uh, play around with that later. And what's nice about it is it's uh, pretty straightforward because what's cool is that it's essentially um, all the same code. So it's, everything is um, the same, except now we have this, uh, where are we here? We have the convolution network. So let me go through this maybe slowly. Okay. so. This part, the imports are identical. Uh, this is just, you can ignore this. I had helper files before. 
this is um, probably redundant. You probably should ignore this or delete this. Um, here are the settings. Now, instead of uh, eight times eight times one, uh, 28 times 28 times one images, we have 64 times 64 times three, three color channels. Uh, we have our data loader. I implemented the function for loading this. Here we have again our normalization um, for normalizing the pixels between zero, uh, minus one, and one. Here we have three values instead of one because we have three color channels. So each value corresponds to one color channel. Before we only had one grayscale channel, which is why we only had a 0.5 here. Now this is for the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. And then the same for the standard deviations. If you're interested, this data set has a lot of class labels that you can use for different um, purposes. There's also something called a conditional GAN, which you can use to generate, um, let's say, images only from one class. So for example, you can maybe train again and to uh, only generate some, someone with a, a big nose or blonde hair or eyeglasses and things like that. Um, yeah, so then we have the data loaders. I'm only using a training loader. Um, but most of the code is really identical. Here is how the images look like. So just uh, 64 images from the first mini batch. And Celeb A stands for celebrity. So they are all um, celebrities someone downloaded from Google, Google image search. And this is really the main part that is different except the data set from the previous code example. This is now our deep convolutional GAN. So I'm using um, for the discriminator here, convolutional layers, conf to D. Again, still using leaky relu. I'm also using batch norm because it helps with the training and yeah, multiple layers here. And for the generator, I'm using the conf transpose layer. It's essentially um, doing the opposite of a convolution layer. Instead of going from a larger image to a smaller image, if you use the large stride, it would make the image uh, larger. It's like going backwards almost. Okay, um, yeah, and this is it. So if you run this code, it should work like before. In fact, this function here is exactly the same training function I used before. I just copy and pasted it here. So there's no change here. It's exactly the same function. Um, and also the solution to your exercises here with the labels. And this takes a little bit of more time to run, approximately two and a half minutes per epoch. And I only trained it for 20 epochs because it took a long time, uh, almost an hour. And uh, you, you can see it starts with relatively bad images. And then the face images become more realistic over time. So this is after the last epoch. Of course, they're not perfect. It's a simple DC GAN. It's still a very simple GAN method, but you can see um, maybe this person or this person, they kind of look like almost realistic face images. So they're not too bad. So this person two also minutes, looks very realistic. Minutes. Oh, two minutes. <laughs> OK, so I will wrap it up now. So um, if you are interested in GANs, let me just one more time share my slides. Um, if you are interested in GANs, I have some resources here for you. So oops. Full screen. So, of course, there are hundreds, if not thousands, uh, of GAN papers out there. So, I would say these are good ones to start nowadays. They are very, very recent, and uh, one focused really on computer vision. The other one is also kind of focused on computer vision. But these are nice survey papers. They are approximately 40, 30, 40 pages. So, they have a lot of information, but they are really just highlighting what are the current GANs um, that are currently used. And this is, I think, a nice resource if you want to learn about the cutting edge GAN. So what I gave you was an introduction. And with that, you can also catch up with the latest GANs. Here is a figure I created based on a figure I found on the internet. I just annotated it with some sentences describing these methods. So this is like a selection of methods that have kind of shaped the development of GANs. Of course, there are many more influential methods. For example, um, this also stops in 2019. So the alias free GAN is not on there. Style GAN is not on there, but many other important GANs are on there. Um, in my other talk on Thursday, I will talk, for example, a method that is based on this cycle GAN here, which is something that can be used for yeah, something called a neural tri uh, style transfer. OK, so yeah, this is also, if you want to learn really about the individual steps and history of GANs, this is like a good summary of different GANs maybe you want to learn about. 
Um, this is the big GAN, which is currently very popular. And you can see the images look super good if you compare it to what we trained. But of course, this would uh, yeah, require way more resources that we have used. Okay, um, yeah, with that, uh, just want to say GANs are fun. You can do lots of interesting things. So this was like a, just a fun thing I saw the other day on Twitter. <laughs> um, and with that, uh, yeah, just briefly, if you are also interested, I have uh, some lectures on YouTube, um, also including GANs. It's uh, actually a whole deep learning course. I think there are 168 videos, but shorter videos, like 10 minutes, 20 minutes. If you're interested, I have that on YouTube. If you're interested uh, in my book, uh, also would really appreciate it. I have more information here. There's an English version, also a Polish version. And um, yeah, I'm also relatively active on Twitter if I have time. If you like to yeah, catch up and see what I'm up to or connect, um, you can find me also on Twitter. And with that, yeah, thanks for attending this talk. It was fun um, to talk about GANs. And yeah, so I hope you enjoy the sightseeing today. And if you can, otherwise, I hope you have a nice day. And yeah, thank you for, for listening. <laughs>